was an iconic structure. Two years in development. Tens of thousands of dollars more were spent on it than other structures supporting the same business. It was award-winning, winning an architectural award in 1978. It was distinct. It was revolutionary. It had so much put into it that there were little doubts it would be a wondrous attraction, bringing in hordes of folks for years, no, decades to come. Was it a hotel? A shopping mall? A museum? No. It was the Burger King on Burnside. Here it is, a brand new Burger King, shortly after its opening on December 1st, 1977. The structure is very distinct in that it had those old school Burger King vibes, but was still very much its own structure packed with trapezoidal patterns as well as a charming outdoor eating area. I'm not joking when I say this place was award-winning. The architect, a Ted Chillis, won an award from the Portland chapter of the American Institute of Architects in the category of architectural design. The property located at the northwest corner of Northwest Burnside and Broadway, was leased in 1975, with some two years of investment being given to preparing what would ultimately become this final structure. The structure itself also ended up being as distinctive as it was because the local Portland Design Review Committee fought against a Burger King being placed there without having some of that, quote, Portland flavor to it. Ted Chilis was brought on then to design, and the rest was history. Downtown Portland had a Burger King, but not just any Burger King, but a Burger King for the future. A location developed and opened to such pomp and housing such a fast food institution, this Burger King on Burnside Street had nowhere to go but up and was destined to live on forever. Huh. What happened? This was an award-winning structure housing a prominent fast food corporation. How did it come to this? In only 32 years. You really want to know? Okay, you asked for it. I mean, they built it on the fringe of Chinatown in the late 70s. The objective was to get a Burger King firmly in the downtown area, and Burnside and Broadway was about as downtown as it got. But it seems the necessary research into the area was not done beyond that. A lot of time, cash, and architectural conception was done to build a fast food establishment at a wide intersection overrun with druggies, their dealers, and prostitutes among other things. Being built along Chinatown didn't help either. One neighborhood chairperson described the whole area where this Burger King was built as an area you just simply avoided at all costs. Broke down areas like this were relatively common, especially on the northern end of downtown. With extensive urban renewal efforts done during the 1950s and 1960s, Portland engaged in a relatively unprecedented effort in demolishing practically a whole section of the southern portion of downtown, and then rebuilding. While this area was revived, 
lots of other areas were disregarded as, I guess, they weren't blighted enough? By the late 70s then, lots of northern downtown, including Old Town, was a rundown area and a blossoming haven for various forms of crime. So I didn't come to the knowledge that this place even existed until just a few years ago. Like so many other little nuggets of recent Portland history, I found out about this from my girlfriend who is a few years younger than me, but she remembers going into downtown and seeing this Burger King there and being in sort of a state of awe of it. You know, and it sat there vacant for many, many years. And literally just the other day, a couple days ago, she brought it up to me. It's probably the inspiration for why I finally did this video. But she was like, oh man, it was just a disgusting, filthy hellhole. But I really wish that old abandoned Burger King was still there. It's iconic. It seems the first few years were all right, but as the 80s came along, things quickly went south for this quirky BK. Namely, the 80s marked an explosion in the drug trade all over America, leading to a nationwide cocaine epidemic. And this was the case for Portland. Furthermore, mainly in the 70s and heading into the 80s, this was a period of massive closures of mental hospitals and asylums, leading to a huge number of mentally ill persons being loosed onto the streets, many of them having nowhere to go. This synced with a drastic increase in homeless people showing up in the downtown area of Portland that only continued to grow in the 90s and remains one of the city's greatest issues to this day. And the Burnside BK was right in the middle of where all of these issues collided. Homeless people wandering about, some mentally ill and or drug addicted, drug dealers infiltrating the area. One homeless local said that dealing was so out in the open and obvious that you couldn't help but notice it was going on. Another one even referenced that especially on Friday nights, multiple police officers would be stationed in the vicinity of the BK because there was such a high level of crime going on there. Another commenter on a blog, going by the name of Tim Calicrate, expressed that a major shift in the vibe of the area came as a result of the massive influx of homeless people who showed up in Portland to join up with the Rajneeshis in Central Oregon. Of course, no Oregon history lesson is complete without a reference to the crazy old Rajneeshis who set up shop near the small town of Antelope, Oregon in the early 1980s before tormenting locals into taking over their city. Oh, and they're also responsible for the largest bioterrorist attack in American history. But they were alright. Anyway, as the Rajneeshis tried to grow and gain power, they opened up their compound to any homeless people across the country who wanted to join them. Apparently not seeing the potential issues of suddenly bussing in God knows how many homeless people many of whom were likely to have mental problems, drug addiction, and or alcoholism. It was a train wreck, during which time the homeless were ultimately kicked out and left stuck in the middle of rural Oregon. Many of these people just ended up back in the Portland area. How many of them stuck around? Did their arrival really have such a drastic change in the vicinity of the Burnside Burger King? They maybe had a small effect, but it depends entirely on how many of them stuck around in the city and in that specific area. Whatever the case, the onset of the 80s killed any hope of the Burnside BK being an attractive site for your average, everyday consumer. Even frequent visitors hated it. Most comments I found posted about personal experiences at the site referenced occurrences that happened in the 90s, but things probably weren't much different in the 80s. One consumer expressed going there frequently only because they were poor. Multiple commenters expressed specifically using the drive through with one stating there was no way they were getting out of their car with all that drug dealing and prostitution going on. And while this drive through was 
probably okay in its earlier years, with some space between it and a now demolished garage. By 2004, after the BK had closed, and the drugs and criminals remained, a massive low-income housing structure was built directly next to the abandoned building. Imagery of the old drive through wedged between the two buildings, now relatively closed off, makes me cringe to wonder what kind of back alley activities went on back there, out of sight. In 2010, county commissioner at the time, Deborah Kafuri, stated that back in the 80s, she and friends would dare one another to go buy something there. Apparently their equivalency to the thrill of others going skydiving. Possibly the best and most detailed account of the experience of being at the Burnside BK in the 1980s came from a commenter by the name of Roving Thundercloud on the website Lost Oregon, who admitted to working there over one summer during the 80s. This former employee expressed that threats, crime, prostitution, attempted thefts, etc. were just the norm. Druggies and homeless people would often pass out in the dining area and often had free reign of the restrooms as the restrooms were out of view of the employees working at the counter. When the time came to check the restrooms, the mirrors would frequently be broken, for obvious reasons. Used needles and urine-soaked clothing would be left behind. The floors would often be flooded from clogged toilets and sinks. Now, if there's any element to this guy's story, which I'm sure replicated the experiences of many other people that worked at this BK during this time, or probably over the course of most of its existence, the uh, his description of the horrors that were cleaning the restroom that's about the closest thing i can relate to um the theater that i i, I say works i say it past tense because i've been furloughed from there for so long now it's like i don't even work there but the place where i work is in an area that there's um a lot of uh crime and drug issues not too the extent of this burger king or you know certain parts of downtown portland but I remember going into check restrooms and finding, you know, heroin leftovers there, people's underwear left behind, um, you know, blood stains on the wall that I'd have to go get, you know, a special kit to go clean up. And it was just some, usually nighttime, um, some nights you, you didn't know what you were going to stumble upon when you go into a restroom. And sometimes there was like emergency situations, There'd be blood on the floor and you wouldn't know where the person was. Um, but even then in being able to relate to some degree to this guy's experience, like his experience is still like way up here and I'm still like hovering down here by comparison. <laughs> the most I guess shocking element of this former employee's account is how fearlessly people would try to just take their money. I'm not talking armed robberies here, but just trying to reach over and pull cash from the registers, right in front of the employees. This commenter said that a friend of his would keep part of a broom handle by the drive through window to beat people's arms back when they tried to reach in and grab something. Another co-worker apparently had to throw a pot of coffee at someone once just to get them to back away. Even by today's standards of ghetto fast food eateries, this is remarkable and really gets to, at its core, how messed up things got at the Birdside Burger King. For reference, I've been to the Burger King at Southeast 100th and Stark a few times, as well as the Eastport Plaza Burger King over by where I worked. These are some of the sketchiest fast food eateries in town, and even then, you never saw or heard about people frequently trying to snatch cash from the counter or the drive through especially to the point of employees needing to arm themselves. Quite possibly the peak of the detritus that was this BK in the 1980s is a story that still, interestingly enough, considering how recent it would have been, lingers as an urban legend. 
I have not been able to find definitive proof that it actually occurred, but, reportedly, during the 80s, a homeless man climbed into the BK's trash compactor, either looking for food or a place to sleep. Probably the former, unless this guy was a real daredevil. When the compactor was activated, the man reportedly was heard screaming for them to stop it from inside, but the machine couldn't be stopped in time to keep him from being crushed to death. There are claims that this story is true, but it still could very well be a myth. I found in a book titled City of Weird, which consists of oddball fiction stories based on Portland lore, One of the stories is clearly based on this unverified compactor story wherein a cashier at a Burger King intentionally kills a man in their trash compactor. Once more, in the 1990s, the city of Portland found many of its neighborhoods fixed up and or gentrified. But this area was still left in squalor. Its reputation as a drug den was still strong as ever, with lots of druggies loitering in the area. One local homeless man recalled a story of two crackheads who'd just gotten food at the BK, and once outside, one of them felt he'd been shortchanged. By a penny. The two crackheads then proceeded to get into a fight over the penny, leading to police arrival and the arrest of both men. As the intersection remained mired in crime and vice, it took the Burger King down with it over time. The location was finally closed down in 2002, ending quite an era. Even with this closure date, there's still one lingering Yelp review on their site, dating back to August 2008 from a Katrina W., who, understandably, gave the place one star. Katrina then expressed having gone there one time for a drink and some fries before expressing the relief of having made it out of there alive. But it's really in its closure that this particular place has maintained an almost cult-like status in the city. The building sat, boarded up, wasting away for nearly a decade before the central city concern purchased the property to build a clinic, which now stands there today. As dealers continued to loom in the area, while others used the building as their own private bathroom, the Portland Mercury reported that police were called to the location more than 1,250 times from 2005 to 2010. It was a lingering reminder of the darkest elements of the city, both past and present, It was depressingly hilarious and awkwardly iconic. An abandoned fast food hellhole left there to remind locals of its memory every day. For even those who hardly know the area, when they traveled on down Burnside, their eyes almost invariably landed on this bizarre piece of 70s architecture. Even those who felt it best to finally demolish the old place were still saddened to a degree by the fact that it was no longer going to be around. Even in contemporary online posts, sometimes about completely unrelated things, people still love to call back to that sketchy, abandoned Burger King. We all loved it. Don't lie to yourselves. My own girlfriend, who first brought the memory of this place to my attention, still expresses Literally the other day, she wishes it was still around. Something to offset all the trendy architecture that's rapidly overtaking the city. And I only wish I'd paid more attention in the past so I could have my own little memory of having seen the place. I probably wouldn't have cared at the time, but I'd sure as hell care now. This place was a piece of history. The kind of history I really love. The history most others love to hate. The history they always want us to forget. Sure, it was dark. Sure, it was sad. But it was weird. And it was Portland. From what I understand, weird is something Portlanders are all about. No matter how much time passes, or how much more craziness happens in my city, one thing's for certain. The Burger King on Burnside will never be forgotten.